historian explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and other platforms. If you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. As Jeff mentioned in my last episode that I posted, which was a discussion with Jeff Schulenberger about the dawn of everything, I semi-regularly produce so-called Myths of the Month, and I hope that my next installment will be another Myth of the Month. And if you want to have a vote on what the next Myth of the Month subject will be, you can follow me on Twitter. And I often post polls about my next topic in the queue. So if you want to have input, look for a historian splain on Twitter. But right now I'm going to produce the second installment in my series on the history of Florida, Fortresses on Sand. So I already posted the first one a few weeks ago, which discussed the indigenous world and civilizations of Florida before European contact. And this second installment, I want to begin in perhaps an unexpected place and time. I'm going to start in the year 1502. And in that year, an Italian agent and possible spy named Alberto Cantino was at work in the city of Lisbon, the capital of Portugal and the capital of a rapidly growing maritime empire. And in the later months of that year, Cantino left Lisbon and made his way back to his home country of Italy, probably first to Genoa and then to Ferrara, where he reported to his employer and patron, the Duke of Ferrara, and brought him various information and reports. But probably the most important thing, and certainly the most historically impactful prize that Cantino brought back to the Duke of Ferrara was a set of six sheets of parchment, which he had hidden and probably smuggled among his effects to get them back to the Duke. And these six large sheets of parchment, when properly arranged and stitched together, formed an enormous world map with a size of about six feet by three feet. This world map, which we know today as the Contino Planisphere, showed at least part of all the continents of the world. It is the earliest surviving map to show significant sections of the Americas and some semblance of the entire globe. In particular, the Cantino Planisphere shows very detailed and accurate depictions of Europe, Africa, and India, clearly based on extensive information gathered from Portuguese voyagers all around those parts of the Eastern Hemisphere. In addition, along the western or left end of the planisphere, we can see most of the Caribbean, including depictions of Hispaniola and Cuba, and to the south, Brazil. And Brazil is depicted as a very lush land with figures of trees and parrots, clearly a place that the Portuguese had been exploring and celebrating as a fertile and promising land. And the map also specifically shows the line of longitude that the Pope had chosen and promulgated in the Treaty of Tordesillas as dividing the world between the putative domains of the Spanish and the Portuguese. So whoever made the map was clearly conscious of the significance of that dividing line. So how did Cantino get his hands on this map? Well, most likely this map was copied from and based closely upon the so-called Padrão, which was the enormous secret royal world map held in the royal palace at Lisbon, which the Portuguese authorities carefully guarded since it served as a major storehouse and representation of this rapidly accumulating knowledge that they were gaining from their agents and spies and explorers fanning out all around the globe. Contino himself probably paid some insider in the palace to act as a spy, basically, to produce for him this remarkably lavish reproduction of the Padrão. 
Now, as I said, there are many remarkable features of the planisphere, including its very detailed and, by our standards, quite accurate depiction of Africa. But there are also more fuzzy or ambiguous aspects of the map that continue to be controversial. Most significantly, if one looks to the far western edge, as I said, there is what appears to be a depiction of Cuba. And the eastern end of Cuba is represented a bit more correctly than the western end, which apparently was still comparatively unknown. And then just beyond the western end of Cuba, if one looks to the northwest, there is a representation of a landmass that ends in a long pointed peninsula pointing southeastward towards Cuba. And this point of land that projects from this landmass towards Cuba is represented as having a very complex coast with a lot of inlets and channels along the western side. And then beyond this peninsula, there are clusters of many small islands. And along the coast of this peninsula and the islands around it and the landmass extending north of it, there are various labels with Portuguese place names. So it has often been questioned and disputed exactly what this projection of land near Cuba represents. Some have argued that it is a slightly misplaced depiction of the Yucatan, which we know European explorers had encountered and described by this time. But as you might tell, it's rather in the wrong position. It's placed northwest of Cuba instead of west-southwest. Others have claimed that it is a sort of imaginary and erroneous representation of the east coast of Asia, which the Portuguese supposedly thought was right near Cuba. But one problem with this argument is that the eastern coast of Asia is already represented over on the other end of the map. Most likely, considering the details shown on the map, it's a depiction of Florida based on some source of knowledge, some voyage or scouting mission to which the Portuguese had access. And there are certain features of this landmass that seem to pretty clearly identify it with Florida, even if it's not a very accurate or precise depiction. There is, for instance, the fact that it, it's in the right position, pointing southeastward towards Cuba. It has a comparatively simpler more straight coastline along the eastern side and a very complex and fragmented coastline along the western side and there are clusters of islands along the western side of the peninsula that seem like they very easily could be depictions of the florida keys and the tortugas what is more about four years later another italian map maker who was gathering knowledge and information from various sources named Caveri produced another world map in 1506 which closely resembles the Cantino planisphere although it's very unlikely that he had access to this map which was now in the closed private collection of the duke of ferrara nonetheless the Caveri map is very similar and this suggests that it was probably also mainly based on the Padrão in Portugal. And it also repeats a very similar representation of this peninsula that is almost surely Florida. And when it comes to these two maps and the Padrão upon which they were based, how did this notion, this image of Florida, appear in the first place so early, at least as early as 1502, when Cantino brought his planisphere from Portugal back to Italy. Well, this has been resisted and rejected through the years by many historians because there is no definite known account of a European landing or even European sighting of Florida until 1513 and the famous voyage of Juan Ponce de Leon. So how could this have come about? Well, there is a very likely source that scholars such as Douglas T. Peck have pointed to 
that could have seen Florida, maybe even landed, visited Florida, and reported this information back to Portugal before 1502. And specifically, that is the voyage of Duarte Pacheco Pereira, a Portuguese adventurer who reportedly voyaged across the Atlantic and traveled down the eastern coast of North America, making observations and notes of what he cited, and presumably then reporting this information back through secretive channels to the crown at Lisbon. But no specific reports or accounts of his voyage has been preserved. It's all hearsay. But if it is at least true that he made that voyage in 1498, that very possibly could be the source for this view of southeastern North America and Florida. So the Cantino planisphere is the earliest evidence that has come to light that almost certainly some Europeans did sight Florida, sail around Florida before 1502, maybe as early as 1498. But there is no clue or evidence as to whether they made any landing or had any interaction with the people of Florida. Probably not. What we do know for certain is that the Portuguese did not colonize that whole section of North America, including Florida. They made no concerted attempt to plant a colony or a settlement, and maybe they didn't even land. Perhaps this was all just estimates and observations of the coastline based on a sailing voyage that never landed. Why didn't the Portuguese do this? Why did they miss what seems to us like such an opportunity? Well, the Portuguese had comparatively few people. They couldn't mount many large expeditions with hundreds of sailors or potential colonists or conquistadores like Spain could. Portugal was a very small country with a small population, and they had to stretch the limited manpower that they had very far. And from the Portuguese point of view, they shouldn't waste their time trying to colonize countries that didn't have obvious resources to offer. So you can contrast Florida in that way with, say, Brazil, where, as the name of the country makes clear, the Europeans were very interested in Brazil wood, a valuable tropical hardwood that was used to make dyes. So if there wasn't some obvious lucrative resource to be had, then the Portuguese didn't put much time, effort, money, or manpower into it. And in addition, there was the significant political problem of the Treaty of Tordesillas, this treaty I referred to before, where the Pope had picked a line of longitude and said, the Spanish have the right to conquer west of this line and the Portuguese to the east. So according to that treaty, Florida and all the land nearby was for the Spanish to claim, not the Portuguese. And Portugal had to be very careful not to antagonize this larger power that was Spain. So as I said, traditionally for many years, it was assumed that Florida was not quote-unquote discovered by Europeans until 1513. But that is a problematic claim, both because Florida, of course, was already known for thousands of years by the people who lived there, and because there is this strong evidence that there was some European knowledge, at least in Portugal, about Florida before any Spanish expedition showed up. How did this come about that eventually, a decade or two decades later, Europeans did begin to land in Florida and try to claim and exploit this land? Well, I've already mentioned the very famous name that is rather iconic, at least in the United States, that we associate with the early exploration and attempts to conquer Florida, and that is Juan Ponce de Leon. So who was this man and why and how did he end up in Florida? He was born in 1474 in a small village near Valladolid in an interior region of Castile, northwest of Madrid. And he was born to a fairly obscure family, but one that nonetheless was of noble rank. And in all of these ways, Juan Ponce de Leon was very typical of the men who became leaders of conquistador missions. 
He came from the so-called Hidalgo class of minor titled nobility, which were very common and widespread in interior Castile, in regions like La Mancha and Extremadura. So these were areas that had been gradually conquered and claimed by European Christian knights during the reconquest against the Islamic Kingdom of Spain. So there, there was this strong infusion of a warrior class and a warrior tradition. But as the reconquest came to a close in the late 1400s, a lot of these men then found themselves idle. And in these interior areas of Castile, they were comparatively more dry. They were largely grain and olive growing. They were comparatively poor. They were not connected to the increasingly lucrative Mediterranean and Atlantic trade and the ports like Seville or Barcelona. And so there was this large Hidalgo class that was more and more vestigial, facing poverty, no longer politically very relevant, and could not transition easily into the new imperial and commercial world because they were forbidden by law and custom from engaging in trade. If you were a noble, you were supposed to be a warrior, not a merchant or an artisan. So this was a large class of men. You can think of Don Quixote de la Mancha as the sort of fictional embodiment of this class. This Hidalgo class in Castile was basically saved from total irrelevance by the contact with America, which suddenly presented an enormous opportunity for small fighting bands and expeditions to go out and fight and try their luck and use these military skills that they had. And moreover, because of the imbalance in technological resources between Spain and the Americas, where the Spanish had iron and steel weapons, armor, horses, firearms, etc. They could really press this advantage dramatically. So this Hidalgo class of Castile supplied most of the successful leaders of Spain's conquests in America. Men like Hernán Cortés, who overthrew the emperor of the Aztec Empire, and Pizarro, who did the same to the Incan Empire. These were all from this Castilian Hidalgo class. Ponce de Leon can be seen to follow in the same basic pathway, but he was less successful. He was certainly very important in the history of North America and particularly in Spain's establishment of a foothold in America north of the Rio Grande. But within his own lifetime, he was basically a failure. And hence, Americans in recent years have kind of taken him and retrospectively made him into a tragic hero, someone searching for a utopia, the fountain of youth, etc. But in fact, he was just another warrior adventurer, like so many others who rushed from Spain to America. And his undertakings and adventures didn't end up having very much impact until after the end of his life. So that is the place where Ponce de Leon was born and raised in an uncertain, unidentified village near Valladolid. But in his youth, he served as a squire to the commander of the Order of Calatrava, a chivalric order with roots in the crusading tradition. He joined into the army that successfully conquered Granada, the last Muslim stronghold in Spain in 1492. And he didn't waste any time after that final conquest of the Reconquista, the following year in 1493, he volunteered as an adventurer on Columbus's second voyage to America. His activities through the rest of the 1490s are unknown. He may have been in the Caribbean or he may have been going back and forth, back to Spain, but he became an officer in the Spanish forces occupying Hispaniola, and he led the suppression of a Taino revolt against the Spanish conquerors in 1502-4. So with this success in defeating Taino resistance, Ponce de Leon was granted an encomienda, which is the right to exploit native labor on a certain zone of territory. So he 
he gained an encomienda and used indigenous people as forced laborers on agricultural plantations in the eastern end of Hispaniola. He was able to make a certain amount of money by selling agricultural products to supply ships that were voyaging back and forth between Europe and the Caribbean. He also married in this period. And in 1508, King Ferdinand, who was the king of Aragon and also had taken up the regency as the de facto ruler of Castile after the death of Queen Isabella, King Ferdinand looked favorably on Juan Ponce de Leon and gave him a further license to use native labor in a gold mine. And pursuant to that, he also then was granted the right to explore and possibly colonize the island of Puerto Rico, which, although it was well known to the Spanish by that point, it had not been conquered and colonized the way Hispaniola had. Ponce de Leon founded the first small Spanish plantation on Puerto Rico near the site of what's now San Juan. He was able to become further rich exploiting this encomienda labor on plantations and mines in both Puerto Rico and Hispaniola. In 1509, he was formally appointed as the governor of Puerto Rico, and he moved his residence permanently to Puerto Rico and started to try to enlarge this colony. The overworked and exploited Taino people naturally again rebelled and were forcibly suppressed. Meanwhile, while Ponce de Leon's enterprises on Puerto Rico were succeeding and booming, at the same time, Diego Colon, who was the son of Christopher Columbus, sailed to Hispaniola, which was the main base and center of Spanish power in America. And he claimed the title of viceroy, deriving from the grants and promises that the Castilian crown had given to his father, saying that Christopher Columbus and his successors would have this title of viceroy of the Indies. The royal government had at first refused to recognize Cologne's claim on this title of viceroy, but Cologne sued in the Cortes, the sort of highest judicial council in Castile, demanded recognition under these patents that had been granted to his father. He succeeded, he gained a favorable ruling, and in 1511, Diego Cologne appointed judges from among his friends and allies. He appointed judges to take up control of Puerto Rico and supplant and oust Ponce de Leon. So Ponce de Leon was naturally devastated, but he had an ally and supporter in King Ferdinand. So Ferdinand, although he had lost this legal battle and had to defer to Diego Colon's claims, nonetheless, he encouraged Ponce de Leon to keep exploring for new lands, particularly to look outside of the Antilles, this main island chain around the Caribbean that was most familiar. And Hence, if he did so, Ponce de Leon could possibly claim or conquer lands that were beyond the authority of Cologne. So if one interpreted the legal arrangement very strictly and narrowly, Diego Cologne only controlled the Indies, which could be taken to mean just the Caribbean islands. So by the end of 1511, Ponce de Leon was being urged to go out on exploratory missions, possibly missions of conquest beyond the Indies. And it happened that he had heard reports from indigenous people and interpreters, reports of a large peninsula, which they called Bemini or Bimini, which reportedly was flat, tropical in climate, and home to large cities with great wealth, including gold. So we cannot know for certain exactly what was going on here, but most likely these descriptions of Bemini were actually referring to the Yucatan, which fits this description, a large, flat, tropical peninsula home to large cities, which had wealth. But it seems that the Spanish, including Ponce de Leon, confused these descriptions of Bemini with another large, flat, forested landmass situated to the northwest instead of west-southwest. And this other peninsula that they heard descriptions and reports about was near the Bahamas. And in particular, one Spanish slave raider had supposedly blown ashore in a storm and landed on this large peninsula. So it seems that these different ideas and reports merged together 
and combined in certain people's minds. Hence, a notion arose that there was a large, rich land home to great cities with great wealth called Bemini, which was located to the northwest just beyond the Bahamas. And the Bahamas by this time were very well known, thoroughly explored, raided, and exploited by the Spanish already by this time. So hence, it seemed possibly promising that the Bahamas could be used as landmarks and way stations for a possible voyage to Bemini. Hence, in February 1512, Ferdinand drew up a royal contract giving authority to Ponce de Leon to explore and conquer Bemini. And naturally, the Columbus family, led by Diego Colon, was very upset, and they intervened and proposed to send their own relative, Bartolome Colon, instead. And Bartolome was a brother of Christopher Columbus. So they argued that he should be granted this license, but Ferdinand overruled them and stood by Ponce de Leon and further declared that Ponce de Leon would have the title of Adelantado in whatever lands he managed to claim. And this was very significant because Adelantado was a title similar to governor, but with even greater power and dignity. And it originated from the experience of the Reconquista, where Christian powers would take control over large territories that had been under Muslim control, and then create an adelantado as the sort of first ruler to institute Spanish Christian governance in this zone. So it's fairly clear that Ponce de Leon's motives when he prepared to go on this voyage to Bemini were mainly prestige and riches. Right? He wanted the prestige and the dignity of being elevated to this higher title, which was very meaningful to him coming from this chivalric Hidalgo background in Spain, and the possibility of wealth in the form of gold. Now, you may notice that right up until this point in the story, there is no hint of any connection to the Fountain of Youth. And indeed, if one looks through the earliest surviving evidence and references and documents about Ponce de Leon, there is no evidence there that he had any interest in a supposed Fountain of Youth. And this idea that that was his goal or his aspiration it's not impossible. There were long-standing stories throughout Eurasia of a paradisal utopian land with some sort of fountain or spring that restored youth. And it's not inconceivable that maybe Ponce de Leon or someone in his circle had that in mind, but there's no evidence of that at all until a number of years after he was dead. And in the year 1535, a chronicler at the Spanish royal court named Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo wrote an account called The General History of the Indies. And he was the first to make this claim that Ponce de Leon's goal was a finding a fountain of youth. And Oviedo hated Ponce de Leon. They were bitter rivals and opponents at court. Oviedo was more favorable to the Cologne family and their faction. And Oviedo, in his account, General History of the Indies, claimed that Ponce de Leon was impotent. He was suffering from, quote, el enflaquecimiento del sexo, the softening of the sex, and that that's why he was going off in search of this tropical paradise in order to restore his sexual function. And that claim then, for whatever reason, caught on and was repeated and woven into other later accounts about Ponce de Leon's voyages. It then was basically, it seems, forgotten for a couple hundred years until it was revived then by the American writer Washington Irving, who was a great romantic and who wanted to cast Ponce de Leon as this sort of romantic, tragic figure in quest for some sort of perfection, some sort of paradise that could never be reached. But again, it is possible that maybe the Fountain of Youth was in somebody's mind, but it's highly dubious whether that was really part of his mission. What we can say is that he was looking for land to conquer, 
He was looking for cities, he was looking for wealth, and he was looking for the glory and prestige that would come with this mission. So in March 1513, Ponce de Leon organized his first expedition to the northwest to search for the land called Bemini. He financed the mission at his own expense. He gathered three ships and about 200 men and set sail on the 4th of March. The original logs of his voyage are lost, but later accounts and excerpts that have been copied over by other chroniclers give some degree of detail about the events of the voyage. It seems that the fleet under Ponce de Leon made brief landings on various islands in the Bahamas, including one called Guanahani, which reportedly was the site of Columbus's first landing in the Western world. On March 27th, after sailing westward for several days, they made their first sighting of land that might be a large peninsular landmass. From that point, they sailed northward, finding that it was, in fact, an extensive body of land without clear or easy harbors in which to go to shore. On April 2nd, they finally put down anchor near the shore and waited there overnight. On the morning of April 3rd, they went to shore and found a site where they encamped for five days. Their activities during those five days on land are unknown. They are not recorded in the later accounts. Also, the precise location is not clear, and the location of this first landing on the North American landmass is heavily disputed, but current scholars tend to think it was either near what's now St. Augustine or farther north. On April 8th, they set sail again and began sailing southward, retracing some of their steps and looking for further land to the south. On April 20th, 12 days later, they saw a site of habitation on the coast with multiple houses, and they wanted to investigate and possibly make contact with the people there. So they anchored offshore, and then again the following day on April 21st, they tried to go ashore. But their boats were caught up in a very powerful current carrying them northward, which maybe sounds familiar to people who have sailed around Florida. And the fleet of three ships, it comprised two caravels and one smaller brigantine. And the two caravels were able to put down anchor close to shore, but the ropes were pulled taut, very tight, and violently twisted to the point that they were afraid they might break. The brigantine, the smaller supply ship, which was better equipped to be able to go ashore, was simply swept northward in the current and out of sight. So the fleet was now beginning to be separated. Nonetheless, the caravels did launch a landing boat to bring some men ashore. But before they even reached the shore, they were charged by natives who seized the oars and weapons off of the boat. We can't say for sure why they did this. It may be that these people saw this as a kind of initial diplomatic gift exchange, which was very much a requirement of diplomatic encounters in indigenous North America. They might have simply opportunistically wanted to take new tools or weapons that they hadn't had before, or they might have seen this boat as a military threat. They might have learned somehow from informants from the Caribbean or maybe from previous encounters with Europeans. They perceived this landing boat to be a military threat, and so they wanted to disarm it. But for whatever reason, the Indians in this area made this confrontation with this initial landing party, and then they withdrew and basically disappeared at, at night. So Ponce de Leon and his party then set up camp on shore and then started to trek northward on foot, hoping to find this brigantine that had been carried away to the north. While they were doing so, a party of 60 Indians, so a significant team, attacked their camp. And in the skirmish, Ponce de Leon was able to take one of them prisoner, whom they then basically drafted to be a guide and interpreter, which was the common practice among European conquistador expeditions. 
They also, somewhere, wherever they were located at this point, they set up a stone cross to mark their claim. And this cross has never been found, if it really existed. They also christened the region Florida. And there are multiple reasons probably why they did so. It was springtime. They may have been impressed with this sort of verdant and abundant vegetation all around them. Also, it was just after Easter at this point, and Easter was sometimes traditionally called Pascua Florida, or the sort of celebrations of Easter were called Pascua Florida, the flowery Easter. So they may have been also inspired then by the time of year to give it this name. And it happens, of course, that is the name that is stuck. And it may have taken them this long, at least according to the records, it took them until this point to christen this land with this new name. And it may be because that's how long it took for them to reckon with the fact that they were not in Bemini, right? This was not an urban civilization like they were hoping to find. This was a tropical land with a comparatively sparse indigenous population, at least, you know, as compared to the Central Valley of Mexico or the Yucatan. So after this point, the party was able to regather and regain their ships They then turned and sailed southward, charting the coastline of South Florida and then the Keys beyond the southern end of the peninsula. They reportedly had to struggle against a massive current and sometimes were unable to even advance forward under full sail. But nonetheless, little by little, they were able to wind their way through the chain of the Keys and all the way out to the dry Tortugas far out in the Gulf. At that point, they perceived that they had reached the end of the island chain, and so they turned and sailed northeastward in order to return back to the mainland. And by no later than May 23rd, the party landed at Charlotte Harbor, a large inlet in the southwestern section of Florida that, as you may remember, is right in the middle of the Calusa Kingdom, a large, powerful, and militaristic kingdom. Now, somehow they were able to survive for at least a day or two, and they then started to sail southward and pulled into a small bay, probably an inlet near Sanibel. They landed on shore and pulled the small brigantine onto shore in order to start repairing it and preparing to leave and possibly go back to Hispaniola or Puerto Rico. But before they were able to pull up anchors and withdraw, a party of canoes launched from shore and called out to them. So this was people probably from the Calusa kingdom now taking the opportunity to make contact and interact with them before they left. And the Spanish did not see this as friendly. They saw it as threatening, and they continued to try to leave. But the canoes set right out to sea after them. The Calusa had the ability to voyage at sea in these canoes. So they set out after them, pursued them, and at one point grabbed hold of a line of one of the ships. So the Spanish were compelled to either fight or acquiesce and go ashore and interact with these indigenous people. And so they went ashore. Once on shore, a fight broke out and they fought a small skirmish. They took several women prisoner from this indigenous group. And then they set up a camp. And over the following several days, they began trading with the local Calusa people, mainly trading for pelts and precious metals, which were two commodities that were valuable enough for them to be interested in. And in particular, they found it promising that the Calusa were willing to trade to them a set of sculpted body ornaments that were made of a metal alloy called guanine, which was a complex alloy of gold, silver, and copper. So this seemed to indicate that there was some source of gold that they could possibly exploit. So the Ponce de Leon party camped on this shore, maybe on Sanibel, for about two weeks. And towards the end of that period, they heard information about a ruler whom the Spanish record as being named Carlos. But it may be that that Carlos is a Spanish corruption of of Calus or Calusa, the, the ruler of the kingdom. And this Carlos supposedly had gold to trade. 
So on June 4th, the party boarded their ships and again prepared to leave, this time in order to go meet with Carlos. But another canoe rode up, and an Indian approached them and spoke to them in Spanish. And the Spanish figured that this man was probably an indigenous person from Hispaniola, who had had enough interaction to learn Spanish, but then had fled from Hispaniola to Florida, and now was acting as an interpreter. And this man told them that they should stay and wait for a further bartering session in the site where they currently were. And the Spanish were skeptical, but nonetheless, a fleet of 20 canoes yoked together in pairs appeared and approached and then attacked the three Spanish ships. And there was an extended fight with several injuries and deaths. Several uh, Spanish men died despite the technological advantage that the Spanish had. And eventually Juan Ponce de Leon was forced to sue for peace. He sent some of the Indians that they had captured in the course of this fight ashore with a message to the local leader or cacique, the sort of, could say, local governor or viceroy, whom they called the cacique. And the cacique agreed to make peace and allow the Spanish to leave. But then the next day, the fleet was attacked again, this time supposedly by 80 canoes. And there was a day-long standoff with the Indians basically held back by repeated fire from crossbows and artillery. So eventually the Spanish just decided to disengage and they were forced to flee and withdraw. But they took with them some captives as guides and translators, as was the custom. And some of these guides had greater knowledge of the surrounding geography. So they tried to look for more islands around the area. They returned down to the island chain of the Keys and the Dry Tortugas. And there they were able to feed themselves by hunting and by gathering turtles, seals, and seabirds. And eventually then, after having stored up some amount of food, they voyaged across the straits and down to Cuba. From Cuba, they then turned back up to Florida again, and then over eastward back to the Bahamas. With this wider voyage then, where they touched down around the Keys, the Tortugas, Cuba, and the Bahamas, they were able to piece together the information and begin to understand that the place where they had landed, that they called Florida, was a large landmass, in particular a large peninsula, connected to an even larger continent. And this peninsula had many provinces. It seems that some of the indigenous people called the peninsula Cautio or Cantio. The Spanish have then took up that name and sometimes referred to it by this indigenous name. But of course that did not stick. It's the name Florida that has stuck. Also, when they were in the Bahamas and preparing to go back to the Caribbean, they encountered a Spanish slave raider named Miruelo. And Miruelo then joined together with the fleet, whether Ponce de Leon liked it or not. And this man Miruelo is very mysterious. It's actually uncertain who he was or where he came from. But Ponce de Leon suspected that he was acting as a spy, keeping tabs on Ponce de Leon on behalf of his enemy, Colón. And rather against his wishes, Miruelo joined in with this fleet. They then were all detained for 27 days on the islands of the Bahamas because of bad winds. At one point, Miruelo's ship was wrecked, and he was able, he and his men were able to get ashore, and perhaps Ponce de Leon enjoyed a bit of schadenfreude for that, but it didn't last for very long because then Miruelo and his team had to combine and go onto Ponce de Leon's ships. So now the crews are all combined together, and Ponce de Leon wished to keep exploring, to go further and find more. But he needed to somehow get rid of Miruelo, this potential spy, before he did so. So hence, in September 1513, the fleet split up. The two caravels, the larger vessels, retraced their steps back to Puerto Rico, whereas the smaller brigantine called the San Cristobal remained in the Bahamas, and once the coast was clear, so to speak, they continued sailing around looking for Bemini. They now 
understood that what they had found, Florida, was not Bemini, and they wanted to keep looking for it. But eventually, they what they found was an island in the Bahamas that had a somewhat similar name, but again was not a large land with great cities. And so, with some degree of disappointment, they then had to give up and sail back to Puerto Rico, which they reached in February 1514. So by that point, of course, Juan Ponce de Leon had already gotten back to Puerto Rico, and he did not like what he found. He found his colony called Capara already ruined and mostly destroyed by Carib attacks, right? attacks by this expansionary militaristic nation, the Carib. And this persuaded Ponce de Leon that his true future lay in Florida, not in the West Indies. So Ponce de Leon went back to Spain in the later months of 1514. He received a knighthood from Ferdinand in recognition for his efforts, although they were not yet very successful. And he was further appointed as Captain General of Puerto Rico, and hence had the responsibility of defending the island and fighting off these Carib attacks and raids. He also got a formal royal commission to explore and colonize both Florida and Bimini, so they now were speaking of these as two lands, and that he would do so with the title of Adelantado, which was what he had wanted all along. So Ponce de Leon then returned to Puerto Rico, was occupied for a few years with this chore of suppressing Carib attacks, and he was delayed but eventually prepared a second expedition to Florida, and he began organizing it in 1520 with the aim of colonizing, moving European and possibly African colonists onto this landmass. He gathered three or maybe four ships. This second voyage is more mysterious to us. There there is less surviving record preserved about his second voyage. But he gathered three or four ships, a large contingent of men, mainly from Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. It included, again, about 200 people. And with them also were some priests and friars and some agricultural stocks and animals. So an indication that they were hoping not just to conquer a city, but to create a self-sustaining settlement. The voyage launched on February 26, 1521, and it landed sometime later in the area of Charlotte Harbor, again possibly at Sanibel or maybe on the mainland by Punta Gorda. And probably they returned again to this spot in the southwestern corner of Florida because of the possibility of gold that had been promised to them on the previous voyage. This settlement in southwest Florida lasted for about five months, but something went wrong, and there's reference to, in July of that year, some sort of battle with the Calusa in the interior of Florida. So maybe they had gone voyaging and exploring into the interior, maybe they had been drawn into the interior by attacks. But for whatever reason, they were pulled into a fight in a very unfamiliar environment. Tropical interior, which was not the sort of place that Spanish conquistadores were accustomed to. It seems that Juan Ponce de Leon himself was struck in the thigh by an arrow. And his nephew, who was on the voyage, was also injured. And because of this defeat, this new threat, it seems the colonists withdrew to their ships, and then set sail in order to flee to Cuba, which was now largely under Spanish control. Along the way, Ponce de Leon's nephew died and was buried at sea. Juan Ponce de Leon himself made it all the way to Havana, but once there he died of the of an infection from his injury, and it's conceivable that maybe the arrow was poisoned in the first place. And he was initially buried there at Havana, but then later his relatives had his remains moved and interred at the Cathedral of San Juan in Puerto Rico, which they viewed as more of his home. And his vessels and goods in Cuba were all seized by local officials and basically sold for a profit. So if we look back at this failed effort to colonize Florida in 1521, This tentative colony, again, was 
right in the Calusa heartland near the Calusa capital and power center at Mound Key. So its fate was really in the hands of the Calusa, in effect. And the Calusa almost surely by this point had heard about the extensive Spanish raids and conquests going on in the Antilles and the Bahamas. And they decided not to allow a permanent Spanish settlement. They might have chosen otherwise, as some indigenous people sometimes did. They might have said it was to their advantage to have an avenue of trade for important goods like iron tools and weapons with these Europeans. But for whatever reason, the Calusa decided not to allow this and drove them out. And furthermore, Spanish corruption and malfeasance in Cuba then finally ended the project, made it impossible for anyone else to take up leadership of the same team for further endeavors. And hence, there was no successful Spanish colony on the peninsula for another 40 years. So we can take Ponce de Leon's second voyage as the first attempt by Europeans to colonize Florida. And then it was followed very quickly on its heels by the first attempt to colonize above Florida outside of the tropical zone in the sort of larger mainland landmass of North America. And that endeavor was led by another conquistador named Lucas Vazquez de Ayon. So all through the 1520s, the Spanish sponsored frequent slaving raids on the Bahamas. And these islands were increasingly depopulated by these attacks and also by epidemic diseases introduced into the islands inadvertently. In the year 1521, so at the same time that Ponce de Leon was going to the southwest corner of Florida, in that same year, a major sugar planter and royal magistrate in Hispaniola named Lucas Vazquez de Ayon wanted more laborers. Indigenous population of the Caribbean was already devastated and declining, so he wanted more workers and he sent raiding parties to get slaves from the Bahamas. But more and more on more and more islands, there were simply none left. They were just totally depopulated. So instead, they continued further to the north-northwest and landed at a bay called Winya Bay in South Carolina, in what's now South Carolina. And they found this to be a very fertile land with a mild climate. The local indigenous people called the area Chicora. And these raiders took some captives one of them they baptized as a Christian and renamed Francisco de Chicora, and they brought them back to Hispaniola. So this was very interesting to men like Ayon, that there was this new, possibly promising land with a larger population farther to the northwest beyond the Bahamas. So in 1523, Ayon traveled with this captive Francisco de Chicora to Spain, on royal business, right? Ion was a magistrate, a royal official, so he had formal reasons to go to Spain. But while there, Ion got a further royal patent, or cedula, authorizing him to conquer and colonize Chicora. In 1525, Ion sent another scouting team to explore the coast, and they charted the whole area from the Savannah River up to the Outer Banks, basically all of what we now call the Carolinas. And the year after that, in 1526, Ion gathered a large expedition with over 600 people, so several times bigger than Ponce de Leon's voyages. And they included male conquistadores, also several dozen women, some enslaved African workers, Francisco de Gicora himself, and several other Indian guides and interpreters, several churchmen indicating a desire to Christianize the land, and they happen to include Antonio de Montesinos, who is famous, a Dominican friar who is famous as the first advocate for indigenous rights in the Caribbean and a mentor to Bartolome de las Casas. They also brought lots of livestock and loaded all of these people and goods onto six ships. They departed in July 1526, reached Winya Bay in August, and basically from that moment, the entire undertaking was a continual disaster. The flagship quickly sank with a great deal of supplies lost. The Indian guides and interpreters, perhaps not surprisingly, immediately ran away into the land. 
the site happened to be too isolated for sustained trade with the Indians, which these colonizers really needed and expected. So they decamped to the south, probably down into the area that's now Georgia. It's theorized it might have been, their site might have been Sapelo Island in Georgia. In September, they built a settlement, which they christened San Miguel de Hualdape. However, the site had a lack of clean, fresh water. There were outbreaks of dysentery, scarce food, surprisingly cold weather, which the Spanish really had not anticipated or prepared for, and hostile native people who refused to trade. Again, maybe because by this point, word had spread about the Spanish menace. One group of Spanish raiders actually set out on their own and attacked an indigenous village, and most of them were killed. Ayon himself, the leader, then died in October, and very quickly a schism arose between potential leaders who disputed over whether to stay or to give up and withdraw back to the Caribbean. The formal leaders of the colony insisted on staying, and so there was a mutiny led by those who wanted to withdraw. The mutineers effectively seized control of the colony, but for one reason or another, they were attacked and undermined by rebelling African servants, maybe because they saw some advantage to staying in the colony. But regardless, the colonists did withdraw and sail back to Hispaniola through very cold weather and scarce food, and ultimately only 150 out of the 600 or so survived. So this failure of the Ion expedition had an impact on Spanish thinking. It made it clear that future expeditions had to be better armed and equipped in order to fight and demand tribute by force from indigenous people because peaceable trade seemed to be impossible. It gave them better warning about the seriously cold autumns and winters to the north. And if they wanted mild winters like the Caribbean, it was clear that they had to stay further south, at least south of the St. John's River. And in this way, the failure more or less set the boundaries of what Spain could easily expect to colonize. There was a wetter and warmer area along the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast up to about the St. John's River, where the Spanish would not have to deal with the potentially harsh freezing winters further north. And in this way, it more or less set the bounds of what the Spanish called Florida and of what we today refer to as Florida. So Ayon's failure sort of set up all these red flags for the Spanish, as you can see. And it basically created a long pause of several decades before the Spanish would try again to create a colony in Florida or further north. However, there was very quickly, within no more than two years, there was another Spanish landing and encounter with the people of Florida, but this one was unintentional. It was an accident and it was similarly disastrous. So that was the 1528 expedition under Narvaez. So Spain was holding off on trying to colonize Florida until it could mount a larger and stronger armed expedition. But nonetheless, in December 1526, right on the heels of the failure of San Miguel de Guadalpe, King Charles V, who now was the, the king of Spain and emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V gave a grant to a military commander named Panfilo de Narvaez to colonize the Gulf Coast across west of Florida, closer to Mexico. Narvaez was from Castile, like these other conquistadores we've talked about, and he had taken part in the Spanish conquests of Jamaica and Cuba, so he had a good deal of experience, and he gathered together an expeditionary force in Spain. So this one was organized and formed back in Europe. It again had over 600 men, most of them fighters, a lot of them were mercenaries or adventurers from not only Spain, but also Portugal and Italy. And it set sail from Spain in July 1527. The intention was to sail across the Gulf Coast to the area of Mexico and plant two Spanish towns in the area of Tampico. They stopped over on the way at Hispaniola and Cuba, where they then lost some vessels in storms. These, all, all of these expeditions keep getting hit by storms. About 100 men deserted in Cuba, 
after hearing about the disaster of the Ayon colony and what a failure that had been. So that warning sign led some of the men to flee. And the voyagers had to stay in Cuba for several weeks, trying to recruit more men to make up their numbers and to restock their supplies. In February 1528, they set sail onto the Gulf and immediately ran aground on shoals and then had to wait again for storms to come in order to lift them off of these shoals. In March, they set sail again, intending to sail west towards Mexico, but they were severely blown off course by a hurricane, and they were then not able to redirect themselves and sail back towards Mexico because of the extremely powerful Gulf Stream current. So where did they end up? In April 1528, they sighted land in Florida, just north of what we now know as Tampa Bay. And the pilot of one of the vessels was Miruelo, that same man that we talked about before who joined up with Ponce de Leon in the Bahamas. And Miruelo conducted them southward, basically with the correct expectation that they would find Tampa Bay if they went south. But on the way, they sailed into a, small, a smaller inlet called Boca Ciega Bay, which is close to Tampa Bay in present-day St. Petersburg. They saw buildings there set atop earthen mounds, and they took this as a sign of wealth and civilization. One envoy was sent ashore in search of food and water, which they increasingly needed, and maybe also gold, if possible. And this envoy was able to trade glass and small trade items like this in exchange for food. So Narvaez ordered his crew to go ashore, and they set up camp. And they proclaimed Narvaez governor of this land, and they read off a document called the Requerimiento, or uh, demand, which was, by this time, was Spain's formulaic text that they would declare when encountering a new country, where they would demand the submission of the indigenous people and demand that they accept Christianity or else be attacked. This was all read off in either Latin or Spanish. It meant nothing. It was nonsense to the local indigenous people. But nonetheless, this was the sort of ritualistic formal act by which Spain would claim dominion over a land. So they read off this requerimiento. Then parties went inland and found a large Tokobaga village where they stole food and gold. And the local people, wanting to get rid of these Spanish invaders, directed them north towards Appalachie, saying that there was a larger, more powerful kingdom to the north that had a great deal of gold. On May 1st, with this information, Narvaez decided to split the group into two teams, a land and sea contingent. Both of these groups would go northward with the expectation that they would then reconnoiter when they reached a large harbor. And it seems that Narvaez here was making a, a big mistake, that he thought that Tampa Bay was further to the north, which was incorrect. It was south of them. At least the mouth of the harbor was south of them. So they're directed to both go north in parallel and meet up at this large bay, which didn't exist. And so hence everything got confused. They both headed north, but they didn't find the harbor and they didn't find each other. They never ended up meeting up. The sea fleet couldn't locate the land group. They got confused, turned back, sailed around in circles, and eventually gave up and sailed to Mexico. The land group continued to march north. They ran out of food. They found villages along the way, which they were able to sack and take their grain. So a lot of these villages were living with storehouses with a good deal of maize. They eventually entered Timucua territory, at least a section of it, and they were immediately met by a diplomatic group led by an important chieftain. They made an exchange of diplomatic gifts. The Timucua learned that they were headed northward towards the Appalachie, and naturally, they were more than happy to conduct them right through their territory so they could be directed straight into Appalachie. They crossed the Suwannee River, and then the Timucua, it seems, disappeared and withdrew, leaving them alone. Again, which seems reasonable, considering that they didn't really want to help or encourage this expeditionary force. They just wanted them to go away. 
On June 25th, the party crossed into Appalachie territory. They found a small village and attacked and raided it for food and took up residence in the houses. At that point, it seemed as if the path was simply clear ahead of them. However, Appalachian guerrilla units started to opportunistically attack them and torch houses, and this set the pattern for the next year or two. So the Spanish moved on, continued to the northwest. The Appalachian continually attacked and harassed them on the way and then retreated, right, in guerrilla fashion. The Spanish were running out of supplies, running out of manpower and strength, so they tried to reach the coast. And in doing so, they had to cross through a large swamp. They were attacked by Appalachia on the way through the swamp. As they got closer to the coast, they reached shallow waters where they could gather oysters in salt marshes. But they were still very hungry, and there were no sign of their ships. So fearing total starvation and really unable to fight, they made a decision. And in early August, they decided to refashion their weapons and armors into tools and use them to build boats to try to get to Mexico. And they, it seems by, according to reports, they were very resourceful. They used deer skins and palm leaves, pine tar, horse hair, and so on to make five boats. 242 men successfully set sail on these boats on the Gulf and headed west. But on this voyage westward, they lost many men, over a hundred to disease, thirst, the devastation of storms. A hurricane, another hurricane, then forced the 50 survivors to land in Texas, possibly near Galveston or maybe farther west. There they were then quickly caught up in tribal wars, disease epidemics that were breaking out from the European contact, and starvation, just food shortages. One officer of the mission who was still alive, named Cabeza de Vaca, was able to lead four survivors through South Texas and into Mexico, where they then finally met up with Spanish scouts in 1536. And the writings of Cabeza de Vaca are the main source that we still have for the details of what happened in this expedition. So the Narvaez expedition, although the goal may have been more practical of, of setting up a colony in Mexico, it ended up being an even greater disaster than the Ion expedition had been, and it f- sent a further message that getting men and goods across the Gulf of Mexico was a lot harder and more hazardous than it might seem. And in that way, I think you can say it further delimited the zone that the Spanish could reasonably hope to colonize and control, and increase increasingly their realistic horizons were limited to just that tropical southeastern corner that we know as Florida. So all of these three Spanish colonization missions that ended up, whether intentionally or not, in Florida, under Juan Ponce de Leon, Ayon, and Narvaez, provided harsh lessons and serious warnings for the Spanish about trying to colonize North America. Nonetheless, Cabeza de Vaca's stories about traveling through and surviving in North America fired some people's imaginations. And one of them in particular was a man whose name you have heard, Hernando de Soto. And so de Soto was inspired to seek to launch his own expedition into North America. And he was born in 1500 in Extremadura, in another one of those interior zones of Castile. And he was from the next generation, younger than Ponce de Leon or Navarrez, but from the same class, from that same sort of Hidalgo class. And he took part in conquests in Central America. He served as a captain in Pizarro's expedition that conquered Peru, and reportedly during that expedition he actually guarded the captive emperor Atahualpa and taught him chess. So he he formed a sort of personal relationship with that Incan emperor, and then he led missions of raiding and plundering, especially of the Incan capital at Cusco. 
After the conquest of Peru, he asked to join further expeditions south into Chile, but he was turned down for unclear reasons, and so he returned to Spain. And when he was back in Spain, he received various chivalric titles, and he was granted a license to conquer Florida. And he wanted to go back into North America once again, but avoid making the same sorts of mistakes. And he wanted to go further inland to continue searching for these large wealthy cities that the Spanish hoped existed in North America and to obtain conquests and gold like he had done in Peru. So his mission was not so much an effort at colonization like the previous three. It was more of what was called an entrada, a sort of mission of conquest and invasion. So de Soto gathered a large force of over 600 men, including Spanish and Portuguese fighters, adventurers, and mercenaries, and also some Africans, both free and enslaved. He also included in the expedition some craftsmen and artisans who would have useful skills and some priests for evangelizing the country. He also brought hundreds of horses, which would be useful in invading and traveling through the continent, and a lot of livestock. And he gathered these resources and men onto nine ships. And in 1539, the fleet set sail for Cuba. And then after landing at Cuba, it turned north to Florida. And in May of that year, it landed just south of Tampa Bay. And they went ashore and marched northward up into the Timucua region of north central Florida. And it happened that once there, they met up with Juan Ortiz, who was a lone Spanish explorer who had gone on his own into the land in search of Narvaez, but did not find him, naturally, and instead joined Timucuan society and became an interpreter and translator for De Soto among the Timucua. And not only that, but Ortiz was multilingual and could act as a sort of a diplomat coordinating relations among multiple different groups and the Spanish. And he was so valuable to the De Soto expedition that he was actually allowed to continue wearing Indian dress and basically living an Indian lifestyle, which was controversial to some people in the Entrada. Nonetheless, the De Soto expedition began moving northward through Florida, attacking Indian villages and taking their food and taking captives and enslaving them to use as porters, laborers, and guides. The Timucuans were mostly overwhelmed, right? They lived in basically small towns and villages that were only loosely confederated. They were not able to mount an effective opposition until eventually, at some point, a large enough Timucuan force came together to face off against the Spanish, and the Spanish defeated them at a site called Napituca and massacred the captives, so killed about 200 Timucua fighters. Now, this whole time and afterwards, as the expedition continued up into the continent, their route is very uncertain, and there's been a lot of debate and guesswork based on small clues in later reports and accounts and on small numbers of archaeological clues. There's been a lot of guessing as to exactly where the De Soto expedition went. But it is clear that in the autumn, in October, they entered Appalachian territory, as the Narvaez expedition had done before. And they found the towns and villages abandoned and emptied, probably a strategic move by the Appalachian to avoid head-on confrontation and to try to deny supplies. So De Soto reached the Appalachian capital of Anhaika and took the town over, which was practically empty, and used it as their winter encampment. And they stayed there from October to March and basically tried to gather enough food to survive and gather intelligence and information about the country. In the spring of 1540, they then left Anhaika and continued northeastward into what's now Georgia, basically raiding 
pillaging and occasionally trading with friendly groups as they went. And this segment, this phase of the DeSoto expedition I discussed in my History of 100 Objects number 5 about a set of Venetian glass beads that were found at a site in Georgia that almost surely were trade items from the DeSoto expedition. And that particular find is so significant because real surviving physical evidence from the DeSoto entrada is so rare. Later, the expedition eventually turned westward, went through the southern end of the Appalachians, probably, and then continued until they reached the Mississippi. And Hernando de Soto himself died of a fever on the banks of the Mississippi, but the rest of the expedition was able to cross the river and then continue westward and southwestward until they reached Mexico. And after they had left, the major sites like Anhaika were then reoccupied. So these indigenous civilizations that encountered De Soto were able to survive, but not without great damage and a lasting impact. So from the Spanish point of view, the De Soto expedition was understood as a failure. There was no great jackpot discovery of these rich cities that they were hoping to find and conquer. But nonetheless, it was the biggest and the most impactful European incursion into North America before the creation of permanent colonies. It introduced new animals, particularly pigs, into the ecosystem. And still today, in the American South, one finds wild pigs descended from DeSoto's livestock. It created lasting hostility and suspicion towards Europeans not just in Florida, but all around the Southeast. It basically ensured that when Europeans did create colonies, there would be no honeymoon period like other colonizers had enjoyed in some places like Brazil. And it also introduced large doses of new pathogens and new diseases like smallpox. All of these effects would then make Spanish colonization more difficult down the road. So the Spanish strongly preferred to colonize and trade among large native societies. They had a different approach from what the French and especially the English would take, where they would try to displace the natives and just move in as much population as possible, take over the land and, and farm. Instead, the Spanish preferred to colonize in smaller numbers to trade and to establish dominion over the existing native societies. But after De Soto, these societies were increasingly devastated by disease and the survivors were hostile and basically embargoed the Spanish. So all of these effects of the De Soto expedition would then come dramatically into play 20 years later, when finally another Spanish expedition was able to create a colony that at least lasted more than a few months. So over the course of the 1550s, the Viceroy of New Spain, which was the title for the Spanish ruler, proxy ruler, ruling over the whole area of Mexico and Central America, the Viceroy of New Spain wanted to create a stronghold somewhere on the northern or eastern side of the Gulf of Mexico because he hoped that this would provide, for one thing, a safer stopover point for Spanish ships trying to cross the Gulf, which was so difficult. Secondly, it would deter possible French colonization, and the French were increasingly interested in trying to colonize and control North America, and it could serve specifically as the beginning point for an overland route through North America to the Atlantic coast, where Spain hoped that they would be able to create more colonies in the same basic area where Ion had tried in South Carolina, in what we now know as South Carolina. So for all of these reasons, New Spain was really interested in putting in the money, the men, the labor to create a colony on the Gulf. And in 1559, a colonization mission was launched under the command of Tristan de Luna y Arellano. 
And Luna was an aristocratic fighter born in Spain, but who had grown up mainly in America. That was one thing that made him a bit different from the earlier generations of conquistadores. He was largely shaped in New Spain. And he had had experience with Coronado's expedition, searching through the southwest for the legendary golden cities of Cibola. And he had also taken part in suppressing an Indian rebellion within Mexico, in the Oaxaca region of Mexico. So he had experience with ruling, governing, exploring, and warfare. And Luna gathered together about 500 soldiers and about a thousand civilian colonists. So this was a new kind of mission that was backed up by a great deal more population and civilian labor. And they set out in June 1559, and in August they reached a large bay, which was called Ochuse, which they, and which they referred to as Ochuse, but which we know today as Pensacola Bay. So in a large inlet on the northern shore of the Gulf of Mexico in what's now the Florida Panhandle. And they founded a colony there, which they called Puerto de Santa Maria. And they sent out scouts to search for Indians to trade with or plunder. But these scouts were only able to find one village in the whole region. And this is probably a sign of the rapid depopulation and also maybe intentional flight to avoid the Europeans. It's possible that as word, as information got out among the indigenous people of this Spanish expedition, that some of them picked up and left, as had happened before, like in the path of De Soto. And furthermore, before all of the supplies were unloaded from the ships onto the mainland for this colony, they were hit by a hurricane, and two large important ships in the fleet were sunk in Pensacola Bay before those supplies could be unloaded. So they were hit by these two disasters right away, and fairly soon in that first winter, the colony was starving, and they decided to withdraw from Pensacola Bay up the Alabama River to an abandoned Indian town, and they were able to find and forage for abandoned food stores around the area, which enabled them to survive through the, that first winter. They also tried farming, both at that abandoned town site and down on Ochuse Bay. They tried farming, but they found that the soil was too sandy and unproductive. So they were basically waiting for possible help or relief to come from Spain. And eventually relief ships did arrive from Mexico, but not enough, not with enough supplies. And so in the second winter, they went back into a state of hunger and precarity. So Luna ordered a withdrawal, and the population, the survivors, moved out of the colony and began to attack and raid a large Indian town in the area. But the soldiers mutinied. For whatever reason, they didn't want to carry on with this mission. So they returned back to Ochuse, and they were barely able to survive on meager crops, basically of beans and pumpkins. And as spring began in March 1561, Luna himself fell ill, and he was quickly replaced by a new governor named Angel de Villafane, who had been sent from Mexico, basically on the understanding that this colony was being mismanaged and was struggling. So Villafane took up command, and he took a few hundred of the survivors away to South Carolina to try to found another colony. And he left behind just a garrison of 50 men back at Pensacola Bay. The colonizing expedition, as it rounded the peninsula of Florida in order to go up to the site in South Carolina, they were hit by another large hurricane and they were forced to retreat down to Cuba, where basically the group dissolved and the men scattered. Months later, Viafane then sailed back up and returned to Ochuse on Pensacola Bay, and he picked up those remaining 50 survivors and took them back to Mexico. Now, Luna, in the meantime, recovered. He survived his illness and recovered and returned to Spain and basically went into retirement back in Spain. 
Some histories have sometimes said that he became governor of the Yucatan, but as far as I can gather, that is an error. That's a confusion with another family member of his, Carlos Luna de Arellano. So today, the site of the two shipwrecks that sank in Pensacola Bay and the town settlement in what's now East Pensacola Heights are major archaeological sites and studies have found various weapons, iron tools, pottery, wood, and ceramic sculptures, and glass beads that were used in the colony or that were brought as potential trade items. And so this is really by far the most fully understood early European colony in Florida because it left behind these archaeological traces that have been discovered, whereas the foundations and remains of say, Ione's colony back in the 1520s have never been found. But again, the failure of this colony at Pensacola Bay demonstrated the extreme challenge of setting up colonies in this volatile environment where there was little or no native civilization left to conquer or to raid and where there were frequent devastating hurricanes. So at this point, it really is plausible to imagine that Spain might have just completely abandoned the whole idea of trying to colonize the North American mainland above Mexico altogether. But they didn't, and the reason they didn't is because their hand was forced once again by France. And the next colonizing group to land in Florida was not Spanish at all. It was a group of mainly Protestant French colonizers. So in 1562, just the year after Otruse was abandoned, a French fleet sponsored and funded by the French Admiral Gaspard de Coligny gathered in France, sailed across the Atlantic to Florida, in order to scout and look for a possible colonization site, which would serve not only as a site of trade and conquest for France, but also, in theory at least, as a haven for French Protestants who were increasingly persecuted and caught up in civil war and power struggle within France. So Coligny, who was this prominent admiral who was of the Protestant faith, he sponsored this voyage, but he did not go himself. He was too busy dealing with warfare and political wrangling in France. So he sent an explorer who was also a Protestant named Jean Ribot, and Ribot went ashore somewhere in what's now northeastern Florida. He met with a Timucua leader named Satu Riwa, who seems to have been the main leading political figure in a certain area along the northeastern seacoast of Florida. And his subjects were a sort of significant subgroup of the larger group called the Mokama, meaning the people of the ocean, basically a name for the Timucuan tribes along the Atlantic coast. And Satu Riwa and his followers dominated the area around the mouth of a large river. And we cannot say absolutely for certain where this was, but most likely it was the St. John's River and basically the area that's now Jacksonville. And at the mouth of the river, Ribot erected a large stone monument with fleur-de-lis carvings, basically planting a marker of a French claim at the mouth of the river. Ribot's expedition then sailed north along the coast and planted a small colony with 28 men in a kind of small makeshift fortress on the island now known as Paris Island in South Carolina. From there, Ribot then returned to France, and he was quickly pulled into the political crossfire. He actually was arrested and imprisoned for a period of time in England, and in the meantime, the 28 men at Paris Island were left stranded without communication or supplies, and they eventually decided to abandon and sail back to France, and they probably would have died at sea, except that they luckily were rescued by some English sailors. So the whole project was halted for a time by this political crossfire back in Europe. But nonetheless, in 1564, another Protestant French leader named René Goulin de Laudonniere 
returned again to Florida with a group of about 300 mostly Huguenot sailors and adventurers. And this group included a number of skilled laborers, civilians of various sorts, some women, and also the artist, the noted artist Jacques Lemoyne de Morgue, who was brought along in order to document and depict the plants, the animals, the natural environment in this land. And they had the idea of creating a commercial outpost, which again, as I said, would also be a haven for persecuted French Protestants. So in Florida, they founded a settlement which they called Fort Caroline in honor of the French king, King Charles. And it's centered on a triangular fortress set atop a bluff, which they were able to site and build with the help of friendly Indians in the area. And it has usually been thought that Fort Caroline was at the same basic site where the French had previously met Satu Riwa, basically at the mouth of the St. John's River near what's now Jacksonville. But its remains have never been found or positively identified, and today there is debate and dispute among scholars about exactly where it was, and some argue that in fact it was much farther to the north at the mouth of the Altamaha River in Georgia, where it's clear that there was some sort of European fortress. So we actually still do not know for certain exactly where Fort Caroline was. But we know from the written records that they quickly created various practical facilities like a flour mill, a forge, a bakery, and a chapel where where one could perform Protestant worship. And they were able to trade with various Indians, conduct diplomacy much more effectively than the Spanish colony at Pensacola Bay had done. And they learned about and planted tobacco, which they found to be very appealing and possibly lucrative. Now, the very existence of any sort of French settlement in North America was a major provocation to the Spanish for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was an incursion into what the Spanish considered to be their territory, according to the Treaty of Tordesillas. It also was a religious affront, This was an appearance of Protestantism, which they considered to be a heresy, into North America. It also presented a military threat because this small French outpost, regardless of how large or small it was, it could potentially act as a base for pirates and raiders to then prey upon the Spanish treasure fleet. So most of the wealth and benefit that Spain was getting from their massive domains in the New World was in the form of gold and silver mined at Potosi and other enormous mines around the Americas. It was very difficult to move all of this highly valuable gold and silver from the Americas back to Spain. And so each year, the armed ships carrying this treasure had to gather at Havana and then sail in a massive guarded convoy from Havana to Spain. This presented an enormous appealing target to pirates and raiders who could prey on ships that were separated by weather or by failures of navigation and could then be set upon and robbed. So any sort of permanent French base in the New World presented a real practical threat to Spain and to their ability to extract wealth from America. So for all of these reasons, Spain was immediately alarmed as soon as they had intelligence about this French fortress somewhere in Florida. And in the winter of 1564 to 65, the French colony was already running out of food. And some small renegade breakaway groups set out into the country and raided or demanded food as tribute from the local Indians. So although things had started off initially on a good foot between the French and the indigenous people, They quickly soured as it became clear that trade with the native people was not enough to feed this large French colony. And these French raiders took one Indian leader hostage. Diplomatic relations were completely poisoned. 
and some small groups in the colony began to abandon and try to sail back across the ocean to Europe. And this was a big problem for the colony because some of these deserters were then captured by the Spanish, and they then gave away the existence and the location and all of the military intelligence about the French fort. Now, things were starting to look very rocky, obviously, and it seemed as if the whole project might fall apart. But in July 1565, an English trader and adventurer named John Hawkins showed up at Fort Caroline. And Hawkins gave them food, which they badly needed, and a small ship in return for cannons and ammunition, which he could then use in piracy and raiding. The colonists also gave John Hawkins tobacco, which he then took with him back to England and introduced to England for the first time. So, you know, although this French colony is very little known, it may have been pivotal in creating this enormous tobacco industry. So having made these trades with Hawkins, the colony then prepared to use this ship that they'd obtained and the food supplies to abandon the fort and sail back to France. And the whole colony was basically prepared and on the point of embarking and leaving in August 1565 when Jean Ribot finally showed up just in time. And Ribot brought them an enormous trove of supplies and 600 more settlers. So this gave the French colony a whole new second life, and it showed that this really was a major investment by the Protestant party in France to create a lasting foothold in America. But they didn't know that the Spanish crown had already learned about Ribot's fleet going and bringing men and supplies to Florida. And just after Ribot set sail, they dispatched a Spanish conquistador named Pedro Menendez de Aviles to seek out and destroy the colony. And Menendez de Aviles was a former captain general of the fleet of the West Indies, and he was a fervent Catholic. And with crown support, he gathered a fleet and about 700 men. So you can see there's kind of an arms race going on here of ever larger and larger expeditions. And this fleet with 700 men set sail and then raced as quickly as they could to try to reach Fort Caroline before Ribot did, because it would be easier for them to destroy the fortress before it got these reinforcements and supplies. But they were just a little bit too late. And Pedro Menendez de Aviles's fleet reached the shore of Florida and started searching the coast up and down around roughly the area of what's now St. Augustine. And they ran right into the French fleet under Ribot at the St. John's River. And the two fleets acknowledged one another and then engaged in a brief sort of awkward skirmish before the Spanish then withdrew. It was a very complicated situation because both fleets were large and well manned, but the French ships were fewer in number but bigger, whereas the Spanish ships were more numerous but smaller, and it was very unclear to both sides how a battle like this would play out. So the Spanish ended up simply withdrawing down to the south, and Menendez first put down anchor at a small bay a bit south of the St. John's River on September 7th. And he and his scouts picked out a spot on the shore at a small inlet where there was a spit of land that had a source of fresh water and that had a sort of large clearing that used to be the site of a village called Siloy. So more and more the Europeans now, as they go through the country, they're finding villages that are abandoned and empty and sometimes village sites that have just been completely cleared out. So this is what the Spanish found at this small inlet below the St. John's River. And they went to shore and dug a trench. And on September 8th, the following day, they formally christened this settlement site as St. Augustine. So this is what we now know as the founding of St. Augustine. And St. Augustine was intended at this point simply as a military base for staging an attack on Fort Caroline. 
The Spanish flagship called the San Pelayo was a bit too large to enter into this harbor. So it was basically sent away to go back down to Hispaniola while the smaller Spanish ships went into this inlet and began building St. Augustine. So Ribot learned of what was going on and the fact that the Spanish were creating a base at this site to the south. And he quickly conscripted men and set sail on his fleet down to try to preempt them and disrupt their activities before they could attack Fort Caroline. And their ships, as I said, were a bit larger than the Spanish ones, and hence they were not able to enter the shallow bay. And instead, they continued sailing southward, hoping to catch up with and attack the San Palayo, which was now sailing away on its own. But as they sailed down the coast south of St. Augustine, they were hit by a hurricane and they were blown far down the coast and the ships that did not sink, it seems some unknown number of the French vessels actually sank at sea, but those that survived were forced onto shore and the men had to disembark and try to make camp and survive on the shore. So Menendez, for his part, sees this as his window of opportunity, and he quickly marched northward with about 500 men, reached and attacked Fort Caroline early in the morning. And this was quite unexpected. The French were totally caught off guard. Not only were most of their fighting men gone with the fleet that was now shipwrecked, but they also didn't expect the Spanish to show up by land, and they didn't expect it to happen in the midst of continuing stormy weather. So on this morning, when the Spanish approached the fortress, about 50 men in Fort Caroline immediately boarded ships and set sail and were able to escape, and they eventually made it back to France. But about another 200 were either killed in the attack or taken captive as the Spanish captured the fort and then put to death. The Spanish gave them no quarter. So this was a violation of the accepted laws of war at this time. But in Menendez's view, he was a fanatical Catholic and a fanatical Spanish patriot. And in his view, these people at the fort were both pirates and heretics. And both of those things gave him license to simply kill them rather than bother trying to control them and feed them as captives. About 60 women and children survived and were taken as captives, but as I said, the men were put to death. The Spanish then quickly turned around after having taken the fort. They turned around and marched south and continued down beyond St. Augustine until they found about 350 shipwrecked Frenchmen. And these French bands that had gone ashore that were desperately trying to survive had very little chance of fighting, and they immediately surrendered, but Menendez nonetheless killed them by group, groups of 10 by 10. And the small inlet south of St. Augustine, where these killings reportedly took place, was then named Matanzas, which means massacres or slaughter. Now, meanwhile, another small surviving French group had actually managed to flee farther south. And on the 1st of November, Menendez was able to catch up with them and capture them. And this time, after they surrendered, Menendez did allow them to live, maybe because he felt by this point he had completely neutralized any political threat from the French. So these ones he did take captive and allow them to live, except for a small number, about 20 of them, who refused to surrender. And these ones, it seems, fled into the forest to join the Indians, and we do not know for certain what became of them. So the Spanish, in addition to setting up their small makeshift colony at St. Augustine, they also occupied and re-garrisoned Fort Caroline. But the following year, in May, Fort Caroline was sacked by Francis Drake, another English pirate adventurer under the license of the English crown. And Drake torched much of the town, but the Spanish nonetheless held on to the fortress and rebuilt in the following months. Two years later, in 1568, a French captain named Dominique de Gourgues explored the area of Florida and Georgia, 
was able to reestablish contact with Satu Riwa, this old ally of the French, and he was able to attack and kill most of the Spanish garrison at Fort Caroline. But then he withdrew. Rather than capitalizing on this advantage, he again withdrew. And the Spanish then reoccupied and remanned the fort the following year. But then after that, they withdrew and abandoned it, basically finding it not worth the resources and the effort to keep trying to defend this really fairly vulnerable fort. So they withdrew and abandoned it. And instead, they concentrated their men and resources at St. Augustine. They refocused their attention there, basically understanding that if they were ever going to maintain any kind of claim or control over the whole region of Florida, they had to just hold on to one base of power. So St. Augustine miraculously lasted. And for the first time after decades of disaster, struggle, loss, for the first time, Spain finally had a permanent base of power in Florida. And this was significant because it would really become the bulwark of Spanish power and authority in all of North America above the Rio Grande. And for much of its history, the town itself remained very small. This was nothing like Mexico City or even like Santa Fe in New Mexico. It was a small fortified outpost, but at least was enough of a base to launch and supply ships and to keep a garrison of a few hundred men. And this, they found, was really all they needed to make it impossible for any other European state to try to set up their own colony anywhere in that area. It gave the Spanish a massive head start and a massive defender's advantage. So St. Augustine amazingly did last, and it is known today as the oldest European-founded town of any sort in the United States. But it's significant to note that it began merely as a potentially temporary military encampment to stop the French. Right? It was all about this growing sort of Cold War, you could say, over control of America, a growing Cold War between Spain and the Northern European states. And Florida would become a crucial pawn in that power struggle. So hopefully in future lectures, I'll get to talk about how Florida played into that power struggle and how little by little a Spanish colonial society developed there. Thank you.